Hello. It is such a pleasure to be here with you today and to speak to you about something close to me personally that is about machines. Welcome to episode two of the Guest, Ghost, Host, Machine podcast from Serpentine Galleries. It's a podcast where some of today's most exciting thinkers, artists, and scientists look to the near future to assess humanity's place on Earth and beyond. I'm Legacy Russell, and I'm here today with artist Victoria Sin. Today we'll be featuring two hosts, James Bridal and Charlie Fox. Artist and writer James Bridle is concerned with technology and its relation to the self. He coined the term the new aesthetic in 2012. Since then, he's been commissioned by the VNA and the Serpentine, and in his first work of fiction, he compared big data to nuclear bombs. We'll be hearing his talk, Failing to Distinguish Between a Tractor Trailer and the Bright White Sky, in which he explores the morality of self-driving cars. James's talk is really interesting because he talks about basically like a fear of AI or maybe like an opacity with AI and therefore kind of like the importance of of artists to be kind of technologically literate or even activists. I I think what was really great was um, this kind of discussion of how the strength of AI comes from uh, a collaboration between humans and machines. Where do you think the art world is going in terms of AI? Does it excite you or scare you? I mean, I think a little bit of both. You know, we're, we're in this, like, increasingly accelerationist technological society. And in order to kind of stay relevant, I feel like as an artist, you have to really engage with these narratives and this reality. I mean, there are people at this stage who, you know, have done quite a bit of research and work. I think there was a study done at Rutgers at one point, you know, about using AI to create artwork, to paint and what have you. And it kind of brings to light the question of, you know, is a human even necessary to produce artwork? And what happens if you take the human out of the equation? Yeah, so this is really interesting because James talks, well, uses this kind of analogy of the self-driving car to speak about kind of like a human fear of AI. Mm. Uh, He talks about about how basically we should, you know, not fear AI and actually the fear comes from a lack of understanding. We need to be technologically literate as artists in order to be able to use these tools um, to, to be kind of like liberating technologies. Here is Failing to Distinguish Between a Tractor Trailer and the Bright White Sky by James Bridal. I'm going to talk about self-driving cars. Uh, we start in New York City in 1925. And there's an empty touring car stood on the curb in Broadway. And a guy climbs onto the running board of the car and he waves his hand. And without anything else happening, the car starts its engine and it sets off down the street. And it heads down Broadway, meandering uncertainly from side to side. It narrowly misses a a milk wagon and then a fire engine. It gets a little bit further, but then suddenly it veers sharply to one side. And the guy on the running board lunges for the steering wheel, but he doesn't make it and the car smashes into another car. And the second car is filled with photographers who are trying to take a picture of the first car, trying to capture this image of a a vehicle without a driver. The invention of the ship, as Paul Virilio wrote, was also the invention of the shipwreck. The car was called the American Wonder, and it was the invention of the guy on the running board, uh, who was an engineer called Francis Houdina. And the appearance of autonomy was produced by radio waves, which were broadcast from another car driving behind. In July of the same year, Uh, The illusionist, Harry Houdini, broke into Houdina's office uh, and smashed all the furniture and accused them of stealing his name and his mail. Um, uh, Houdina, the first guy, protested in turn that if he was using the magician's name, it would imply that his invention was a trick rather than a genuine working machine. But this network of associations is there right from the start. The car, the illusion, the image, and the crash. So my timeline of the self-driving car begins and ends, for now, with a crash. The second, unlike the first, was fatal. In May of of last year, a man called Joshua Brown was driving, or rather being driven, along a highway in Florida when his Tesla Model S crashed into the side of a large truck. The Model S was the first production car to feature a technology called Autopilot, which offers limited autonomy. Using a combination of radar, sonar, video cameras, and machine intelligence, 
The car can drive itself for hours at a time under many different conditions. Drivers are required to keep their hands on the wheel at all times and receive audio and visual warnings if they don't. Joshua Brown was using autopilot at the time of the crash. In a blog post a few days after his death, Tesla stated that a truck had turned to cross the highway in front of Mr. Brown's car and the car's sensors had failed to register it. Neither autopilot nor the driver, they wrote, noticed the white side of the tractor trailer against a brightly lit sky, so the brake was not applied. Mr. Brown was a huge Tesla fan, and he posted numerous videos on YouTube showing off the features of his car. He posted his last video in April, just a month before he died, uh, and it shows his car under autopilot control, swerving to avoid a tow truck that shifted into his lane. It's called Autopilot Saves Model S, and you can still watch it on YouTube. And you can hear the Malcolm Gladwell audiobook that Brown is listening to, and you can hear him say, holy shit, as the car suddenly moves by itself to one side to avoid crashing. But before the actual crash, investigators revealed, Brown had been driving for 36 minutes without his hands on the wheel, and he'd ignored seven separate warnings. While the truck should have been visible to the driver for seven seconds leading up to the crash, a portable DVD player was found in the wreckage, and the truck driver testified that Brown had been watching a Harry Potter movie when his car went under the truck, and it was still playing in the wreck <laughs> afterwards. In 1971, in an essay for the AA's magazine Drive, J.G. Ballard wrote, quote, If I were asked to condense the whole of the present century into one mental picture, I would pick an, a familiar everyday sight, a man in a motor car driving along a concrete highway to some unknown destination. I think, he continued, that the 20th century reaches almost its purest expression on the highway. Here we see, all too clearly, the speed and violence of our age, its strange love affair with the machine, and conceivably with its own death and destruction." Unquote. It's important to note that self-driving car is not in itself dangerous. As Tesla noted in that blog post, um, there's on average one fatality every 60 million miles driven worldwide. Uh, and Mr. Brown was the first known fatality in 130 million miles of driving under autopilot. But then the danger posed by the self-driving car is not merely one of road death. It's one of lack of understanding and lack of control. As Ballard noted in that essay, the appeal of older cars, of vintage cars, is that they're comprehensible. They are, quote, rooted in the 19th century, a visible and easily grasped technology of pistons, flywheels, steaming valves, a far cry from the new technologies of the late 20th century, a silent and mysterious realm of invisible circuitry, unquote. This tendency has only accelerated in our own time, from black box devices to inscrutable cloud platforms. You may have heard the recent story about American farmers paying UK Ukrainian hackers to fix their tractors, uh, because the machines are basically entirely driven by software now, and the farmers are contractually not allowed to even open up the bonnets and fix them themselves. This aesthetic and technological obscurity breeds a political unease and, and corporate contempt. In recent weeks, much has been made of the battle between Transport for London and Uber, uh, the taxi company that's become a byword for corporate greed and social irresponsibility. Because beyond their well-documented sexism and disregard for local laws on taxes, employment rights, the reporting of sexual assaults, Uber wields technologically, technological ambiguity as a weapon. This ambiguity starts in the user interface, where the system at times creates what are known as ghost cars, fake rides in the user's vicinity, which are generated to convince the user that the service is more active than it really is. Rides are tracked without the user's knowledge, and a God's eye view is used to stalk high-profile clients. Particularly pissed off uh, the London government was a program called Greyball that's used to deny rides to government employees investigating the company's numerous transgressions. But perhaps Uber's greatest perceived sin, and the one that takes us back to the self-driving car, is the social atomization that it produces. 
Taxi drivers are no longer employees, but precarious contractors. Riders are alienated individuals, contributing to the offshoring of tax revenues, the decline of public transport services, and the class divisions and congestion of the city streets. The ultimate goal of Uber's business, whether that's driving cars or delivering takeaways, is to replace its human workers entirely with machines. Its own self-driving car program is well advanced, and its retention of humans is ultimately a matter of cost. Unruly humans, despite their lingering desire for the freedoms of city life, are, for the moment, marginally cheaper than pliable machines. But this situation will not last much longer, and the self-driving car is a herald of all forms of automation, which will deprive millions of work in the coming decades. All of this was forecast by Ballard in 71, of course. Uh, nationwide traffic reports, satellite navigation, direct debit toll roads, the remote electronic control of the vehicle, all are predicted. Sooner or later, he wrote, it will become illegal to drive a car with a steering wheel. The private car will remain, but one by one, its brake pedal, accelerator, and control systems, like the atrophying organs of our own bodies, will be removed, unquote. And with those control systems goes the freedom that the 20th century idea of the automobile entailed. It's the death drive, but virtualized. But while Ballard's forecast was accurate, it didn't and doesn't have to be inevitable. The deployment of self-driving cars and full automation to engender loss of control, alienation, and immiseration is hardly surprising, but it's not inescapable. Just because it's a technology, whether it's autonomous vehicles, satellite communications, or the internet, has been captured by capital and turned against the populace, doesn't mean it doesn't retain some seed of utopian possibilities. The self-driving car for me is a fantastic example of this tendency, because properly regarded, it's the opposite of autonomous. Whereas the 20th century automobile, equipped with a paper map and some jerry cans of fossil fuel, uh, could light out for parts unknown under the sole control of the rugged individualist. The self-driving car is enmeshed in an infrastructure of renewable energy, electrical power, satellite signals, slippy maps, over-the-air updates, and messy human desires of other people. It must continually re-examine and revise its view of the world, adapting to and learning from its environment and the experiences of other vehicles. Its perceived intelligence is always and utterly a networked intelligence. Far from being a vehicle for individualism and selfish freedoms, the self-driving car necessitates a return to the communal and the social. The moral and regulatory obstacles faced by today's exploitative, extractive corporate technologies, from Facebook to Uber to Google, exist not because of some residual technophobia or conservatism, but because these technologies are against nature, a nature that encourages our own desires and our own creations. The role of the artist and the activist in such a system is thus to explore the possibilities of these systems, working not against them, but working with them and alongside them and in the grain of them. To give an example of transforming a system from my own work, at the beginning of this year, I spent several months driving around uh, the mountains of central Greece in a car I had fitted out with several cheap webcams uh, and a home-built accelerometer on the steering wheel, and had a laptop in the passenger seat that was recording all of this data as I drove, not very well, uh, around the mountains. And this information was subsequently fed into an open source machine learning system similar to the one used by Google and Uber and so forth to train their self-driving cars. By watching me drive, the system learned to drive itself, and not on the freeways of Southern California or the test tracks of Bavaria, but among the towns and villages of Greece, a place with a very different material and mythological history and present. In this development process, I also emphasize certain different behaviors. My car, primarily, is designed to get lost. Rather than entering a desired destination and sitting back, surrendering decisions over routing to the machine in return for a guaranteed arrival, my self-driving car plots a random course, taking every available exit, off-ramp, and side road in order to prioritize the journey over the destination. The end of the journey can't be predicted, and nor can the sights along the way. The cognitive effects of such a journey are produced in collaboration between human and machine imaginations. 
While sympathetic to histories of the flaneur and the derive, this strategy is ultimately derived from technological approaches to complex problems, and particularly the random walk, a stochastic, algorithmic exploration of the project problem space, which acknowledges the possibility of multiple, contested, and potentially infinite solutions to any given problem. On the other hand, one of the possible responses to this technologically augmented assault directed at individual autonomy today is still resistance and refusal. The off switch should remain within reach. In my research into autonomous vehicles and machine vision, I've tried to develop several strategies for human scale opposition to exploitative automation, such as uh, the, this thing I call the autonomous trap. Uh, this trap is constructed by drawing a pair of nested circles, one dashed and one solid on the roadway. From the outside, this pattern denotes a right of way. From the inside, it means no entry. Thus, any car programmed to obey the rules of the road may enter but cannot leave, like a demon trapped within a magic circle. The trap, while an unquestionably aggressive action, has the potentially emancipatory benefit of being legible to both the human and the machine, and thus it opens up a shared space of mutual communication, not buried within obscure lines of code, but painted directly onto the street for all to see. It uses for its material both the physical stuff of the world and the networked, noumenal, meta stuff of digital video and signal processing. The autonomous trap was inspired in part by my favorite story about networked automotive systems and resistance. In October of 78, the Italian premier, Andriotti, was scheduled to visit Bologna uh, to give a speech, and the city's autonomists were discussing how to protest. In the version of the story that I was told, a comrade named Pino arrived at this assembly, and he silenced everyone else with a shout. And he, he yelled to them all, we must use technology to defeat capitalism. And then he opened up his long coat, and it was hung with all kinds of keys and tools. And one of these keys was the key that opened every traffic light in the city. On the day that Andriotti was due to come and give his speech, the autonomous spread out through the city, and they used these keys to turn every traffic light red, and they turned the entire city into gridlock, and Andriotti never even left the airport. Such is the effect of an embedded, networked, and technologically literate resistance. It must be hoped, however, that our future admits for greater collaboration with our technologies instead of obstruction. Such an approach will require a radical rethinking of our cities and our communities, which is more, not less, in the image of our technologies. If, and only if, we can free those technologies from the grasp of large corporations and opoke, opaque, tech, uh, opaque, bleh, excuse me, opaque politics. Just as the internet itself is an unconsciously generated product of our unconsciously networked desires, so the most quotidian technological products reveal aspects of other loving futures. This possibility exists even within the steel, glass, and gas of the self-driving car. If we choose not to imagine and engage with such possibilities, we too are in danger of failing to distinguish between the tractor trailer and the bright white sky, trapped in the automobile, hands off the wheel, being taken in the most comfortable and efficient manner straight into the side of the truck. Thank you very much. You can see James Bridle's digital commission for the Serpentine Galleries at cloudindex.com. That's C-L-O-U-D-I-N-D-X.com. Our next host is Charlie Fox, a fluent writer on art, but also a young author making international waves. Fox published his first book in 2017. This Young Monster is a series of essays re-examining tales of myth and monster, weaving together pop culture and folklore to tell the stories of people who, in Fox's words, rebel against a reality that's too cruel or boring for them to inhabit. John Waters recommended This Young Monster in The New Yorker. He said, Charlie Fox's breath of proudly putrefied air is really something to behold. Mr. Fox is the real thing. In Karloff, Charlie Fox imagines a conversation between a radio talk show host and Frankenstein's monster. 
Karloff was written and performed by Charlie Fox and produced by Jack Housen. My next guest is a very talented undead young man. He's just written his autobiography. It's called None of This Feels Real, and it's referred to in the new issue of Hot Goth magazine as like chasing a maniac down a hall of mirrors. Let's welcome to the show Frankenstein's Monster. Hey. Monster, bro. Really wonderful to see you again. You were last here promoting that version of The Raven you did with Tilda Swinton and all those puppets. Uh-huh. Weird movie. It was super outre. Very funny, I liked it a lot. And uh, let me just say, pre our famous little quiz here, you were off the map for a little while. I was gone, yep. I was in this coma. Yeah, somebody told me you were somewhat poorly. Yes, pharmacologically askew might be the kindest description. I was having too much fun with all my medications, but nothing helps you slow down like a good old coma. Yeah, cancel summer, I fancy a coma. You know, fuck Tilda, let's OD. Yeah, I mean, for a half accident, half suicide, it was very soothing. Like being submerged in this marshmallow goo swamp for a month, just hearing the blood flow through my veins. And uh, off air earlier, you were telling me about your heartbeat, which is a little bit bizarre too. Yeah, monster heartbeats are so freaky. A human heartbeat is like a clock ticking in a toy chest, and my heart sounds like hot metal being shredded again and again. Like this hideous screaming noise, and the whole thing is kind of dumb because you can't even die. I know. There's always a sequel or a resurrection for me, and I'm dead flesh anyway, so there's no escape, man. Yeah, you're just a bucket of Xmas cheer, monster. And didn't you sleep outside last night? I did sleep on this fetid marsh last night, yes. And thus the unholy stench I'm radiating. Uh Uh-huh, like a putrid yak in a junkyard. Because your dad, Victor, with whom you have multiple, uh, issues, I guess is the word? Well, I killed him with this magic axe I bought. 1780s. Enchanted wood. Sorry, I I had to tiptoe around the concept of killing. Call me a squeamish kitten. No biggie. Your father, he had you sleeping outside as a child. Yeah, I slept in a cardboard box in the rain for a while, and in a graveyard, and in a kennel with my dear hound William Wilson, because Victor didn't want me in the house. He let me back in on Halloween, because he liked that joke. Oh, the one time of the year you could spook everybody and have fun, he was like, no way, kid, indoors. Yeah, it was rough. I'd be muzzled in the kitchen, stroking a hound for hours and playing Dance Macabre on the xylophone. The bone assistant would fix up my old stitches and my oozing wounds whilst we watched Karloff on TV. Now, Karloff will get back to, but your dog is still hardcore. Yeah, William Wilson is alive. We fixed him up with his potion and some electricity after he got hit by a car. And now he's 27 years old. Go, William Wilson. And he sleeps in your dad's house? I never stay in the house. I hate the inside of the house. It's all bats in jars and Tesla coils and garbage. So I left it to the dog. And your hatred of Boris Karloff came out of what? I say in the book, Karloff should be a code word for a copycat, shadow, ripoff. I am MBA tall, I am dead, I groan, I kill things, but... Lots of the population is dead or groaning or killing stuff in their houses tonight, like right now. Yeah, the other scientists who came to see me expected this brain-dead, drooling wreck, which I was not. I was trying to read. I mean, Karloff was like this sick twin chasing me around and I wanted to be rid of him. But, you know, Victor always thought I was his prize laboratory animal. You were like that inside-out baboon from the fly. Yeah, an inside-out baboon. Have you ever eaten baboon? Nope. I've eaten roses, and I've eaten live and writhing snakes. I've eaten swans purple with virulent infection. Even a rancid swan will sprinkle glitter in your bloodstream. Magic gastronomy. Dark magic. And I'm just wondering, you never call Victor dad in the book, or maybe even mother. 
Would mother be more accurate? I never called him this or that. I was just a corpse to him, and he was a thing to me. And you had this recurrent dream on the marshes, which you write about so eloquently, and it's super creepy, beautiful, kind of a nightmare. Yeah, I was on the marsh. It was twilight, and I had this sensation, something sticky and hideous, closing its wings over me, and the whole world suddenly quiet as a crypt. I'm not even sure it was a dream. Something wicked this way comes, huh? Now, is Lurch from the Adams family verboten like Karloff? Lurch is kind of cute. He's just the stoner in the family, too dumb to make Gomez happy. Can you hear the bats fluttering? Is that in my head? Yeah, I guess so. Trippy. And you also reproduce in the book these house tree person tests that your dad administered, if that's the right word, when you were a child, which are just bizarre. Like, you should show them off. How do those tests work? They're a standard psych test. A child draws a house, a tree, and a person, a typical suburban nuclear family scene, and the psychologist asks them a few little questions about it as they go. Who lives here? What goes on inside the house? What is it like inside the house at night? The last one looks really evil. Yeah, that's the best one. I think in the medical notes, Fixer calls it bacon-like or something. Did Francis Bacon ever paint goth houses? No, just screaming meat and tigers in the grass and dead things, I think. He painted a lot of ghosts. But this house you drew is black and spiky and the outside is exposed, which, according to the test, is a symptom of psychosis. That was just a wrong foot victim. Mm -hmm. I mean, I never drew the house as it really was in my head. Which was what? Fairy Castle? That house from Family Guy? It was just a normal house on fire. A house on fire with huge flames raging like mad beasts. But you never drew that? Never ever. But when I drew the person, he was always diseased. There's a big list of diseases in this book that you were into quite deeply, some old favourites. I like the diseases that are only listed in medieval arcana. I like diseases you'd call Mulder and Scully to figure out. So here we have index, whoa, postcoital tristesse, encephalalgia, brain rattle, lunar psychosis, comorbid with werewolf delusions. You don't want any of them. I like the language of diseases, too. It's kind of poetry. I like the words jelly, simian, professor. Ducking your meds again. Maybe I am. So, do you ever howl at the moon? Definitely. I think it's good for the heart and the fangs. It keeps the blues away. Do you have a favourite colour? Rotting flesh, green. Oh, wow. Rotting flesh green makes me feel at peace. My moods are kind of jagged, but just that sweet pus colour makes me feel warm and fuzzy. Do you have a favourite album? Oh, yikes. Uh, thriller, Dope Smoker, Clowny Clown Clown. Are you still a stoner? Yeah. I told my friend this joke. I said... Honey bear, I'm giving up acting and smoking weed again. She says, why? I tell her, so I can focus on what I really enjoy. She says, what's that? I tell her, staring at walls and feeling really, really down. Big laugh? Not really. Favourite TV show? Something with ghosts. I don't know. Scratch that answer. I, I don't even know what's on TV anymore. Dog shows? Remember when Marilyn Manson was on Letterman that first time? He was putting a collar for me too, fucker. Favourite drug? Probably the moon. I remember before I could speak or read, I'd skunk around the marshes watching the moonlight. And because of all the biohazardous shit that Vixen got his mitts on and was dumped there, you get this weird kind of light. Kind of a glam-slash-sci-fi lighting situation. Yeah, the moonlight was just undead sunshine. What a beautiful thing. Any bird that flew into its beam died at once. It was sad to find all those ravens lying dead in the morning. They'd be speckled with this silver tar-like stuff, and I'd huddle in the muck and rub their feathers on my face and sob until it was dark. I didn't know what crying was at the time because nobody told me. I didn't know what was happening to my face. Scratch that answer. 
I don't even know what's on TV anymore. OK, pop quiz over. So what do you have coming up next, man? I'm always excited to hear about your new projects. I want to be a musical version of Donnie Darko. I want to play the rabbit. He's so handsome and evil. I want to tour mental institutions with my stand-up act. I want to live in the woods with my dog and play the flute. So, an ambitious schedule, then. Oh, you betcha, man. I like Wiley Coyote. Have you ever eaten a bin? We've done that part, bro. Oh, OK. Sorry, I'm still not quite myself. The house is still on fire. The house is still on fire. Well, everybody has funny creatures in their heads sometimes. Tis the season, maybe. What's your Halloween costume this year? I might go as the Reaper. Or maybe River Phoenix. Rubber penis? A river Phoenix. Oh, I know who you mean. The ghost kid from the 70s. Yeah, but maybe not. I'd like my face to be a little more distorted. I'd like to hide among the weirds. Yeah, I'd like to hide among the weirds. Monster, thanks so much for being here. It's always such a joy to see you. Call me anytime, bro. You know I'll be out there, making strange noises, throwing a party at the castle. Waiting in the dark, paying my respects to the shadows. Both James and Charlie's pieces make us think about the ethics of artificial intelligence. I think both for the people creating them and for people who exist in a society with them. Both pieces indicate to us that we can't sit passively by and, and let these things overtake us. We need to think about the difference between what's technically possible, which is an increasingly high bar, and what is kind of necessary or even advisable. Thanks for listening to episode two of the Guest, Ghost, Host, Machine podcast from Serpentine Galleries. You can listen to the series at radio.serpentinegalleries.org or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. All of the material in this series was originally recorded at or produced for the Serpentine Marathon in October 2017. Our music is by marathon performer Fatima Al Qadiri, aka I Shy. Dominating devices and spectacles. Guest, ghost, host, machine.